There hey, you go. everybody. My name is Gabe Howard, and I am what? here with an excellent cast of characters. John, are we live? Uh, yes. I'm going to go hope. with I'm going <laughs> to go with yes. All right. My name is Gabe Howard. I'm with PsychCentral.com. And this is our, our final surviving the COVID-19 coronavirus quarantine and pandemic emergency live broadcast. John, we this is this is our seventh one. We, we made it. Yes, we did. I'm so happy that we made it to the end, Gabe. This I, has I, uh, been a really interesting experiment. So it's it's been very cool. And of course, all props to you, John, for coming up with the idea. Thank you so much for being here. All right. The way this works is uh, please head over to YouTube. We are having some trouble streaming live on Facebook. All the other ones have been on Facebook. But hey, for the last one, we decided to mix it up. So share it in there in the comments in YouTube. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And without further ado, we would like to introduce the esteemed panel. Summer, you were here with us on Surviving the Coronavirus Pandemic in Quarantine, Episode 1. So welcome back to the final episode. Please introduce yourself and then pass it off to Sally, then to John, and then, hey, all the way back to me. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So my name is uh, Summer Bukevich or Summer Boretsky Bukevich. I used to be a blogger for, um, for Psych Central. Uh, I wrote the Panic About Anxiety blog. Um, right now, uh, yeah, I still struggle with anxiety. This whole pandemic has been interesting and I'm working on uh, my doctoral dissertation right now. Um, and I do teach uh, full time at a local uh, college, teach marketing and management. And uh, yeah, I have a four-year-old, I'm married, so it's been an interesting uh, experience trying to manage all of that over the past seven or so odd weeks. So um, over to Sally. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Gabe. I'm Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. I'm a psychologist by training, uh, but moved away from clinical stuff a long, long time ago. I was actually running leadership development at a university, and then my brother died by suicide. And so at that point, my life got focused. Um, and because I was really working in systems and cultural change through my day job, I started to see suicide prevention through a lens of systems and cultural change instead of just clinical services. And so that's led me to be a suicide prevention advocate, mostly focused in workplace issues, but also changing culture around suicide prevention. Um, today, I'm calling in from uh, a getaway cabin that our family fled to uh, about six or seven weeks ago up in the mountains in Colorado in a little town called Grand Lake. We're a stone's throw from Rocky Mountain National Park. I'm here with my husband, my 20 one year old 19 year old and 15 year old sons and a number of animals um, in this tiny little cabin so it's been interesting but also a lot of blessings and so i'll turn it over to john great thank you so much i am john grohall i'm the uh, founder and editor-in-chief of psychcentral.com the internet's go-to resource for mental health information and related topics about psychology, personality, parenting, relationships, you name it. I've been doing this for 25 years now and looking forward to the next 25, but hopefully not while staying at home. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, John. My name is Gabe Howard. I, uh, I'm the host of the Psych Central podcast and the show Not Crazy, both on the Psych Central podcast network. And I'm just really excited to be here. I live with a bipolar and anxiety. I advocate in the patient space. And uh, yeah, this is the seventh time I've done this. I have nothing new to share. I drink a lot of Diet Coke. I like pizza. And these are really cool people I'm with. All right, so here's how it works. Remember, in the comment section, please post any questions that you have, and we will answer as many as possible. But the first question that we always ask on these is, how is the quarantine personally affecting you and how are you coping? Who would like to take it first? We'll go alphabetically, Sally. All right, sounds good. <laughs> so I was one of those people that was like, is this really a thing? Is, are we, are, is this really something I should be scared about or is it fear mongering the news? I did that for weeks. And then all of a sudden I was in Sedona with my husband for his birthday and the world closed down overnight. 
um, it was really probably Italy that happened. And I remember after weeks and weeks and weeks of anticipation, like it was finally panic mode. And I went into mama bear mode. I was like, that's it. I am protecting my family and we're fleeing. And so overnight we just packed up the cars and we, we drove up here and, you know, now mapping our experience onto SAMHSA's phases of disaster curve. Like we went from this anticipatory anxiety thing to psh, fueled with adrenaline for several days, no sleeping. I look at my daytime or like I lost a week of just like, where are we? What's happening? Like I didn't, I didn't work out. I wasn't sleeping, like just try to figure stuff out. Um, and then we just settled in. Uh, and it was, it's kind of been this long stretch of what does this mean? I'm a small business owner. Um, and so there was lots of anxiety about pivoting a business when nobody has any money and everybody's super uncertain. Um, there was lots of concerns about my children uh, missing college and their friends. But in overall, the arc of these last couple of weeks have been much more about gratitude um, than fear. Part of that's been kind of an intentional practice, but part of it has been on most days, on a normal day, I would be on a plane somewhere, sleeping in a hotel, you know, running around like a chicken. And for the past, you know, seven weeks or so, I've been having dinner with my family, taking walks with the dog, looking outside at the beautiful nature that I'm surrounded by, and just kind of recalibrating some priorities. So today is the first day since we've been up here that we're starting to head back home and starting to resume some kind of whatever the new normal thing is. And so my oldest left this morning and, you know, a little trepidation in my heart about him making good choices. Um, but we're going to start. We're going to start to see what this next chapter is. So I would say overall, there's certainly been um, a lot of surges of anxiety through this. Uh, but for the most part, it's just for our little family, just kind of been settling into this um, this weird and special time to be together um, and some larger looming anxiety about what does this mean for our world? But I guess that's where I am today. Thank you so much, Sally. Summer? Remind me of the question again, Gabe. <laughs> I'm coping, what's going on, right? How is the quarantine personally affecting you and how are you coping? Okay, so Thankfully, this particular semester, so typically I teach, you know, five courses um, and this semester, knock on wood, <laughs> I, I don't know how I got this lucky, but um, this ended up being my sabbatical set semester to finish uh, my dissertation. So um, I have not shared in the stress that I know a lot of my colleagues are going through with having to have trans transitioned courses online and things of that nature, but this was supposed to be my semester where I can just sit down, send my kid to daycare, come home, work on my dissertation and get it done by March. And here we are in May and it's like, I'm like this close to the finish line. Um, so my expectations for my own progress have been kind of, um, you know, I, I've had to lower the bar. I've had to lower the bar a lot over the past um, couple of weeks and become um, more understanding with myself, more gent like more gentle with myself and compassionate um, through this time because of how much longer things um, ended up taking. Mentally, I began this whole, you know, when this whole COVID situation began, right? So like late March, um, I had not felt like a, a dramatic jump in anxiety. In fact, I actually felt oddly prepared because, you know, living with one thing I didn't mention before, you know, I have a panic disorder, right? So I've done cognitive behavioral therapy for years to help me come down from um, those really uncomfortable feelings of, you know, racing heart, feeling lightheaded, et cetera. So when I started feeling that way, when all, all of this news came out and when I found out that COVID really was going to be hitting the United States, um, I was able to use those CBT tools and techniques almost immediately. And I felt very prepared. Now, after about two weeks or so, my resources sort of got like tapped out, right? Two, two weeks or so after the last uh, live that I was part of. Um, and that's when I started becoming 
pretty anxious. It's almost like that's when reality set in for me. You know, I, I did all the things that everybody else did. You know, I downloaded House Party. I downloaded Marco Polo. You know, at, like everybody almost went a little crazy at the beginning trying to be extra social within the virtual space. And I did that as well. But it started to get exhausting. And I think that definitely had an impact on me. So, um, Somehow I managed to dedicate, I had to use time blocking in order to, to really get my work done, um, but I was able to manage, you know, finish writing the majority of my dissertation. Um, but the big problem is with daycares being closed, you know, my four-year-old daughter's at home. My husband was also at home working full-time. His hours were cut a little bit. So we really had to do some, you know, negotiating within the household to see who was going to do what and when. And, um, it, you know, it's incredible. That part was incredibly stressful. I am very fortunate, you know, that we're all healthy, you know, nothing major has, has gone wrong. Um, but in my particular county, we're still seeing cases rising faster than expected. So that anxiety level is still, it, it's holding steady for me right now. And I don't want to talk forever. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to pass it off to, uh, to uh, John right now, I think. Right? Yeah. He's next. Okay. Yeah, John, you're yep. up. Yep. 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 It, I mean, it's been a long seven weeks, right? I mean, th this is not something that we thought um, would end quickly, but at the same time, you don't know how challenging it's going to be until you're in the middle of living with it, right? And so I can really relate to what Summer just said about, you know, the first couple of weeks, everything was cool. And, but as the weeks have dragged on, now it's becoming months. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely feel um, some of that anxiety and um, just, uh, a, a sense of not foreboding, but not sure when it's going to end. Like I'm, I'm like every other American thinking like, oh, just because you say things are open doesn't mean I'm comfortable with going out and being a part of that. Um, our, our knowledge about the coronavirus itself is still at the beginning stages. And, and that's what's been so frustrating to so many people. People don't realize that um, science of this nature takes time and uh, it's easy to be patient for something in the abstract but when it's impacting your life every day and, and look I, I'm super great uh, grateful and full of gratitude for the fact that you know we're all healthy we're we're, um, we're safe we have access to food because there are so many people who obviously haven't had that experience and, and, and over uh, obviously 70,000 Americans have died. Um, so I feel like my sacrifice is very small and I have to kind of keep that in perspective as, as, as the weeks do turn into months because there are so many people whose sacrifice has been so much larger. The, for the first responders, the, the, the doctors, the nurses, you know, all the people that support those people it's just to think about the amazing amount of work and edit, uh, effort and dedication that they have to their job, even without the protective equipment that they needed early on. It's just, I, I try and keep that in mind. So that, that's, I think that's where I am at, at week seven of, of doing these things. Thank you, John. One of the things that I was surprised about is that I, I live with an anxiety disorder, and as I joked in the first one, all of my coping skills are now illegal, uh, and and it's it's very true. And and even though we're starting to to reopen, like like John said, I'm now maybe they're not going to be illegal, but maybe I don't want to. <laughs> uh, so I don't know how I'm going to work that out. But one of the things that I was really surprised at, at week seven is is anger. A anger popped up. Uh, the anxiety sort of gave way to anger. I, I'm angry at all of the conspiracy theories. I'm angry at all of the people who are saying things like, uh, this is just a hoax to control us and force vaccines on us because I, I, I know people who got sick. I know people who are scared. I, I'm very, very lucky that I, I do not know anybody that has passed away and, and I very much hope to, to keep it that way. But it, it doesn't take much to find stories of those people and find people that have been directly impacted by that. And then to see people just be so incredibly dismissive of it. I'm, 
I'm angry at our leaders who were warned about this ahead of time. And th this is not a political thing. I'm not mad at a single person. I'm just, I'm, I'm mad at the entire thing. Is there something that we could have done or is this just the best we could do? And I'm angry that I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I want to know, but there's a new source that will agree with me and there's a new source that will disagree with me. And, and as I learned, there's also a news group that will blame this on Elvis, who is working with John F. Kennedy, who are, I don't know, in the top floor of Graceland. The whole thing is just very anger inducing because it, I wanted an answer. And I thought something like this would have an answer. And the fact that it doesn't is, is disturbing to me. And I can't decide as of right now on week seven, how much of my anger is reasonable, should people be held accountable, and how much of my anger is, yeah, it's a global pandemic. You, you should rightfully be scared and angry. And, and that, that is where I am at today in week seven. Uh, also, I just really want to go to a Mexican restaurant. I have no idea why. <laughs> Well, I know going back to the the SAMHSA phases thing, I mean, yeah. this is exactly where we should be right now. And, and uh, you know, you have to go through the honeymoon and heroism phase. It's disillusionment, anger, and like hopelessness. And so we're exactly where we are supposed to be. And yeah, I feel that a little bit to the world, but I've also cut myself off from the news just as a coping strategy, but I have seen it in our house. So, you know, honeymoon phase at the beginning, we're playing board games and watching movies together. But now my kids are like, I want to go play with my friends and hang out with my girl and drive a car and uh, and also in some of the business relationships I have, people's fuses are super short, you know? And and like, where did that come from? Why are you yelling at me? What's going on here? And like, oh, it's week seven. Yeah, this is exactly where we're supposed to be. We're tired, we're just tired. Yeah, Sally, you brought up an interesting point that, that I wanna discuss and that that's that's managing the media. And and when I say media, I mean both, both you know, mainstream media, you know, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, you know, all, all of the typical cable news networks and, and local news, as well as social media. What's the answer to that? Because I, I know that some people have this knee jerk reaction, I'm gonna ignore the media, but I think that's dangerous, especially because you don't know what like the World and, Health and the Organization- And the rules change every day, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, what, what does the panel feel is, is the best way to manage the amount of news that we have available. I'll just jump in quick because I have a ritual about it, um, <laughs> which is I, I read it. I read the, the curated summary by the New York Times. It's 10 minutes of my day. I feel like it's a trustworthy source. I get kind of what I need to know and then I'm done. Um, so I don't read it at night. I don't watch it can get all of that additional sensory stimulation. Um, but I feel like I'm more or less on top of what I need to know just from that little bit of curated, a highly credible news source. That's how I'm coping. Thank you, Sally. Summer, John? I, okay, so I, <laughs> I'm not where I ought to or where I want to be with news consumption, um, especially recently. I have been doing way too much reading of the news in the evening, responding to Facebook comments and discussions about COVID. Um, so I'm not where I want to be. But that being said, one of the things that I think that I am doing well with is I'm trying to focus more so on the data, right? Like I like looking at the numbers. I like doing my daily update. How many cases in Pennsylvania? How many in my county? Um, how many worldwide, you know, who's going up, who's going down, et cetera. How are the rules changing, right? Because I feel like that gives me um, a sense of certainty, not, maybe not certainty, but at least reduces my uncertainty, right? Um, once I get into, here's, here's one of the biggest like mental health struggles for me right now. Um, I had initially thought that this whole pandemic would bring people together. Right. I mean, it's a shared struggle that we're all going through everybody, every, every country across the globe. Right. So I, I didn't really anticipate that people would begin separating on like a, a big dividing line. Right. Where, you know, you've got some people who are very pro stay at home and you've got, a, you know, another group of people who are very like, this is a conspiracy. We need to you know, this is garbage. Let's all go out and patronize stores and open despite, you know, closure orders and, and so on. I didn't see that coming, right? Um, so I think that disconnect in what I had anticipated and what we're seeing actually playing out is, is really distressing me and it's really causing me problems. So, um, and I am always, I, I 
call my, like, I feel like a forever educator, right? You know, I, I love teaching and um, I'm not very good with <laughs> boundaries when it comes to teaching. So um, often I'll find myself in the evening, you know, on Facebook, consuming social media and feeling like I need to educate. Um, I think in the long run, in a societal sense, it's a very important thing, um, making sure I help people to check their assumptions, right? Helping people to become more critical consumers of information, because you've definitely got a lot of people sharing content um, with dubious origins. Um, and I feel the need to point that out and to say to, to people, to friends, um, to social connections, like, hey, you know, ask yourself where that came from, you know, um, ask yourself what the motivations are um, of the, you know, the people who produce that content, right? Um, and so that is one of the things that I really struggle with, because from a personal perspective, that is a lot of mental effort. Um, it's draining. But I think in a societal sense, it's really important, because I really do think that we need to have greater media literacy in this country, or else we're all going to revert into our own little um, ideological bubble right? Um, especially with social media, it's so easy to block or snooze or mute people who have opinions that don't necessarily align with ours. And I think in the long run, um, that's, that's, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. So I feel um, both, I'm holding two things at one time. I feel, I feel both compelled to participate in these conversations, yet at the same time, I feel like they are troublesome for my own personal mental health. So I'm I'm working to balance those things right now. Thank you, Summer. Yeah, yeah I think that's super important to um, to the the, the 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 note about self care and and what happens when you engage too much in um, these conversations on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. That um, it can really take a, a dent out of your own mental health when trying to. Um, uh, rebut the, the, you know, the crazy conspiracy theories that are out there today. Um, and I, it, it's a balance and, and you need to feel empowered to take whatever steps that you sh should take if you're not feeling like this is uh, benefiting your mental health anymore. I've, I've definitely um, tried the approach of you know uh, talking to people about uh, critical thinking skills but i think there are just too many people um who 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 don't think that way and who don't have the critical thinking skills and and will never get them no matter how much i try to help with that i think it's it's something about you know how they were brought up their education something um, that people have just given up critical thinking in some instances. And I've had to defriend some people um, because I, I just couldn't take it any longer for my own mental health. And um, it, so it's a balance. And I, I'm, I'm with Dr. Sally in terms of uh, taking a little bite of that, that news um, uh, on a daily basis. I don't try and, and uh, keep up to date on the news at every breaking moment. I think that's probably for most people uh, an unhealthy way to consume news, especially with something that's turning into a long-term thing. I mean, I can understand if this were a, a an event that was, you know, uh, started and done with in a week's time, but it's not obviously. So it's going on for months. So it's not like you have to tune in, you know, five, six, seven times a day and check Google News or Apple News or whatever to see, oh, what's the latest? What did the president say today? You know, because it, it, things don't change that that quickly or that often about what we know about the coronavirus. So, um, I think you know, for everyone, it, it just comes down to finding that balance and finding the amount of uh, consumption that works for you. For what it's worth, I, I sort of feel that uh, Dr. Sally's method of consuming the media once a day, uh, whether it's in the morning or at night or, or whenever, and curating your news is really just good advice. I, I don't think it's good pandemic or quarantine advice. I, I, I think it's really good advice. I, I noticed even before all of this, the news made me just very, very anxious, and I was constantly hitting reload, which of course would make me even more anxious. So I, I think it's uh, really good advice. All right, moving on to the next question. I have a really cool question that we actually got uh, last week, but we didn't have a, a chance to get to. I just thought it was nice. And the question is, uh, 
uh, taking out time with family, uh, you know, slowing down, smelling the roses. Uh, what is a silver lining that you found to being, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what is a silver lining that you found because of the pandemic? Uh, and it looks like they don't want the, I get to spend more time with my children. <laughs> But that is totally the answer for everybody who has kids. Spending more time with our family, our loved ones, and our children, that is, that is the answer. So uh, what is the second silver lining? <laughs> That's a good question, Gabe. <laughs> I mean, you know, one, uh, one of, uh, for me, one of the silver linings has just been that you, you kind of, as Dr. Sally mentioned earlier, you kind of have an opportunity to step back and, and take a good look at your life um, and, and just really have a moment to take a breath, to, um, to slow down a little bit, because I think we are all caught up in, in, and have been caught up in for some time, this, this hectic, never-ending pace of modern life. And I, I guess every generation probably has the same complaint about, you know, oh, you know, life is going too fast. Um, but in some instances, I don't know that previous generations have had this always on access to a never ending supply of stuff coming through your smartphone um, that is desiring of your attention, right? So I think um, the pandemic has, has given me an opportunity to sort of take a step back, reevaluate some decisions uh, about my life and, um, and, and, and engage in more thoughtful um, uh, uh, ways of, of being with other people, um, my friends, my family, my wife, um, and trying to be a little bit more mindful in those interactions. So your question made me think of uh, a course that I took, I'm gonna say 15 years ago, it was through my faith community. It was called Voluntary Simplicity and I failed it horribly. I just could not, I could not, I try, I wanted it so badly and I could not do it. And, you know, when we fled up here, I had one suitcase, like, and I've been wearing the same clothes for six weeks. Not, it's not a problem. You know, if I actually do get dressed, you know, uh, and, uh, I guess just the simple pleasures that I didn't allow myself to have before have come back. Um, one of them being painting. So when I was a college student, I was a, a studio art psychology double major and I just chose a path that took me away from the arts, but I've always had this longing to be, to do my art again. And I have done, I don't know, eight paintings since I've been up here and just kind of re um, connecting with these parts of myself that I was just too busy. So, so busy, so important doing busy, busy things that, um, I, I abandoned those things. And so that's definitely been a silver lining is just uh, the forced, I can't say it's voluntary, but the forced simplicity. Um, I thought I might be bored. I thought I might be lonely. I'm not, I'm actually, it's very renewing. This part of it is renewing. I have to say that my experience is very different, <laughs> I think, from right because you have small children, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's having having a daughter uh, and working on a dissertation. I have had a reduction in the amount of free time that I that I've had. Um, so with that being said, you know, trying to find a silver lining is, you know, I can't find it in in large swaths of, of free time because I, I, I don't have that. But one thing that I have noticed um, myself thinking about a little bit more consciously is um, consumerism and the, you know, I'm not having to get dressed every day. I try to, but I don't have to, right? So, you know, I, I, I open my closet and I, I look at everything I have and I'm like, God, what do I really need? What do I really, what, what do I not need? What can I do without, right? So I've been doing, um, you know, a little bit of mental work with that. Um, the, the little free time that I've had, you know, we are trying to like organize and clean things a little bit. And I realize, you know, there is so much in life, so many physical possessions that I really don't need to have. Right. So, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm seeing that lesson come up again and again, every time I consider ordering something from Amazon or whatnot, I ask myself, well, you know, I'm going to have to like decon this when it, 
you, you know, when, when the UPS driver drops it off on the porch, I'm going to sanitize the package, take it out. Is it really worth it? Um, you know, do I need these, these tangible things or can I make do with something I already have? Um, and it, oddly our, well, maybe not oddly, but our local recycling centers have shut down, I think, because the employees are considered non-essential workers. So we have no good way to recycle right now. Um, so just kind of seeing all of the 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 stuff pile up we're trying to keep it in our garage so that when recycling does open we can still be you know responsible um and not just throw things away but it's really making me think about all of the um unnecessary stuff that comes into our life in a physical sense um that we have to do away with and so i'm trying to at least do some mental calculus on um how to proceed once all of this ends because i think it is going to to some degree change my consumption pattern Thank you, Summer. Uh, a long time ago, Summer was in charge of a whole bunch of stuff at, at Psych Central. And this was before I, I started partnering with Psych Central to do the podcast and blogging. And, and so, so Summer and I never actually worked uh, for Psych Central at the same time. When I came and I took over the YouTube page and, and started doing stuff, Summer had all kinds of videos about anxiety and she had a TED talk and it, it was really cool. And I, I watched them and I thought, hey, she gets it. And she was just some nebulous figure out on the internet that I thought, I don't know, I don't know where she went. I just thought that she disappeared. And, and then during this pandemic, John came up with this idea. And for the very first episode, he said, hey, I'll reach out to Summer. And I was like, oh, I don't know her. I've never heard of this person. And then I, I was like, she looks familiar. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Now you did have a different last name. Like in my defense, I wasn't a complete idiot. <laughs> but no, I, I got to meet Summer. And I know that sounds like really, really lame, but but no, I, I had I was familiar with Summer's work. I like Summer's work. She worked for a place that, that I work and respect and have done a lot of good stuff with. So clearly we had a lot in common. So, you know, we became Facebook friends and we started sharing some emails and some talks. And it, it was really cool to meet Summer. And I I I've met a lot of cool people because of all of this, because we have time to reach out to strangers now. And I've had more time to answer my emails. I, I get a lot of emails from people saying, hey, I really like your show. Here's my story. And I don't have time to answer them all. And I've had time to answer more. So while Summer is the most significant person that I've met, and I hope that we can collab and do something in the future. Stay tuned. Uh, it, there have been other people that I've been able to connect with that I wouldn't have had time to connect with. And I think that just has an extreme amount of value. And, and I'm glad. And Summer, it was very cool meeting you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabe. I, I greatly appreciate it. It's very good to meet you as well. Yes. All right. We have a question from the audience. What is your advice for dealing with close family members that do not take the situation as seriously as you do, like refusing to believe that masks are helpful, et cetera? Panel? So... I don't know if this would be helpful or not, but it kind of struck me. The meme about peeing. Have you all seen the meme about peeing? I did. Yeah. 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 I would just say, you know, just consider this. That's all. <laughs> so yeah, if, you, if you're both naked and somebody pees on you, nah, you're going to get wet. If you have pants on and somebody pees on you, it's going to help. If they have pants on and you have pants on, they're just going to wet themselves. You know, it's going <laughs> to be much better for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, whoever came up with that great idea because it, it 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 illustrates this concept in such a simple and intuitive manner with humor. Um, you know, yeah, so it's a little humor, easier to absolutely. take. Absolutely, <laughs> so so important. And um, and it, 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 in a nutshell, it explains why everybody should be wearing masks um, at least for a time. It's not like we're asking people to wear masks and a, a body suit of armor for the next five years of your life, right? You're, you're asking to wear a little you know, face covering uh, for a few months over your face if you go out in public. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, also putting it into context, like there are people who are you know, putting in 48 hour shifts at hospitals, trying to save people's lives, and you're complaining about a little piece of you know, cloth over your face or you don't think this is real, and yet, you know, 70,000 plus Americans have died. So I, I, at some point, you know, it, it might help to offer some of that information, but um, you also have to realize that you can't necessarily change other people's minds if their minds are set 
for whatever reason. Um, you could explore that and see if these are strongly held beliefs or not. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, if, if, they're, if they're going to have that differing point of view, you have to find an, uh, other ways of um, dealing with the situation and dealing with your fears and anxiety about the fact that they're not taking it seriously, so. I think, um, and you know, this probably isn't true of everybody who is saying, no, I'm not gonna wear a mask. I, I suspect, this is just kind of my opinion here, but I suspect there's probably a lot of people who are anxious about it for several different reasons. Um, the primary reason that I've heard um, from people, particularly on social media, is I can't wear a mask because it makes me feel like I can't breathe and it makes me anxious. I'm like, oh, okay, that's my that's my area of lived experience specialty. I know anxiety and I know it very well. Um, so when the mask mandate kind of first came out for my state, um, I found that, you know, I did the handkerchief mask thing and I said, all right, because um, this is all I have right now. I did end up finding a you know, a, a better mask in our basement from a painting project from last year. But what I did was I put it on and I wore it around the house. I wore it around the house to get a, a feel for it. Um, I wore it around the house to sort of train myself to, um, to feel and to be present for the sensation of breathing and what that was going to feel like, because it is different. It is different, right? Um, and I have always been somebody who's very sensitive to um, I, I'm very hyper vigilant about my body, right? So if I perceive that I'm not breathing correctly, that's something that can incite a panic attack. So I empathize. I empathize with the people who say, no, I won't wear a mask because I think it's going to make me anxious or it's going to make me panic or I'm going to feel like I can't breathe. I totally get it. I've been there. Um, but I think just dismissing it outright and saying, no, I won't do it is sort of the equivalent of saying, you know, I had a panic attack on a bridge once before, I'm never gonna cross a bridge again because that was too scary. You know, you're, you're reducing your, um, your world by doing that, right? So I think it's important to approach mask wearing, particularly when it causes anxiety, um, as a type of like exposure therapy to some degree, you know? So wear it around your house for a little bit. If you can only wear it for a minute or two, that's fine, then take it off. Um, and you know, the more you practice, uh, I think the 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 better you'll become at um, at wearing the mask and becoming more comfortable with the the strange sensations that you might feel while you're breathing through it. Um, that being said, I actually own a pulse oximeter because I have asthma, and a friend of mine said, you know, I really feel like I can't breathe very well when I'm wearing a mask. And I said, oh, science. Let me let me do some <laughs> some personal science here. So I wore it while I put on a mask, and it only reduced my oxygen level by one percent, which is not very much. Um, so it does have an impact. I can absolutely understand why people feel strange, but um, just becoming more comfortable with that sensation, I think is going to help a lot of people um, to, to help others when they go out, right? Because wearing masks is obviously ideal to protect other people. So um, I think with a little bit of in-home, you know, playing around with those masks, I think that can be very helpful as well. Now, granted, that doesn't help people who oppose masks for ideological reasons, but um, I think there's a lot of people out there who do have anxiety about them. One of the things that I thought when I read the question, it, it said, what is your advice for dealing with close family members that do not take the situation as seriously as you do? Uh, if you take out the situation and you put in bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or mental health crisis or mental health issue, uh, you get probably the number one question that I'm asked, which is how do I get my loved one to take their symptoms seriously or get treatment? And uh, the advice that I always have for people there is, first off, you, you've, you've got to make a partnership. If you're screaming at the person, this is serious, put on your mask. That has never worked in the history of ever. Uh, what I recommend is that you talk to them about why you're concerned about it. Uh, you know, say, I, I understand that you don't want to wear the mask. I understand that you don't agree with the mask. And I understand that you don't like the mask, but I also know that you love me. And I want you to know that, that I am scared and that it, it, it worries me that when you don't wear it. So I know that you don't want to wear it for any of the reason that you have read uh, on the media or any of that. Will you wear it for me? I, I'm asking you to do it for me. 
And this, this could help bridge the gap. Uh, if they agree to do it and they tell you that they're only doing it for you and that it's stupid and that it doesn't work, uh, that's also your cue to, 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 to clam it, you got your way. Uh, and, uh, but you'll know that they're doing it for the greater good and to help themselves, but you'll also know that they love you so much that they're, they're willing to partner with you. Uh, finally, it's also a boundary issue. You know, this is where it gets a, well, let, let's go out of the masks. If, if you are telling people, listen, I, I am quarantining, I don't like you showing up at my house, et cetera. Sometimes you've got to put those, those hard boundaries in place. You have to say, no, I am not going to answer the door. I need you to stop inviting me over to your house. I am quarantined and not coming. Explain to them that they are pressing your boundaries at this point. You understand that they have made a different decision than you, but they are not respecting your boundaries and that's not okay. Uh, and then much like religion, politics, and money at Easter, uh, you're going to have to stop discussing it uh, because many of us want to preserve these relationships. We don't want to end our relationship with our parents, siblings, aunt and uncle uh, over a disagreement about a pandemic. Gabe, That's I, what I recommend. I, I think I just want to point out that I, I find a lot of value in what you recommended. And I, I, what I'm seeing here is that you're, it sounds like you're telling people to, um, you're trying to bring people in from the abstract and get them down to this this concrete level, right? So it kind of reminds me of how we all, um, you know, if we're if some some nameless, faceless driver cuts us off in traffic, right? We're going to be really quick to say some bad <laughs> words. We're good, you know. But then if they get out of the car and you know come and approach us, and you know we're, we're, we change, right? We change when an abstract situation turns into something that's more concrete. And I think we're more likely to take things seriously, to watch what we say, and to generally just be better human beings. So. Yeah. I, and I was thinking the same thing, Summer, because, um, you know, I think when we battle some of these invisible abstract ideas that people have about mental health conditions, what gets us through is the science and the stories. And so I was just reflecting on my own experience through this, that the two things that were turning points for me was one, watching the data from Italy, <laughs> right, very shocking. And the other was when I had two people close to me who got sick. And they were, they were very public on Facebook um, about their, their fear and their quick and scary decline in their health. And I'm like, oh, this is real. Um, but it took, a, it took a story, a face, someone I cared about for me to really, and the story data in Italy, but for me to really understand how serious this was. Um, so I, I guess that would be the other suggestion is if, if there's a story that they could relate to, somebody like them, if not somebody they know, who could say, no, 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 this isn't a, you know, like I can't breathe. Cause all of them had the same thing. Like I couldn't get from my bed to the bathroom. I'm like, oh my gosh, you were a fully functioning athlete a week ago. Like this isn't just, you know, abstract people. Like this is hitting a very healthy person very quickly. And um, anyway, so that was what was helpful. Sally, I, I agree. I, I want to add on, you know, a lot of people when this all started, they thought it was only old people or people who were immunosuppressed. And it, I, I saw a lot of people saying, you know, old people and people who are immunosuppressed can hear you when you say that. And yes. it, this people were like, you know, that's a really good point. I, I, I thought that I was just saying it to my healthy friends and family, but I, I'm saying this to people. Uh, I don't know if it changed anybody's mind, but I, I, I was one of the people saying it. And I really thought, oh, wow. I just, I just said that about my grandma, mm -hmm. that, that was, that was a big moment. We are nearing the end of our time. What we like to do at the end is give everybody a couple of minutes uh, to sort of share their final thoughts. And this will be the final thought of the series. So we, we need you to dig deep. What are your takeaway points, everyone, uh, about surviving the pandemic, the quarantine and, and moving forward over the next weeks and months? Sally, do you want to go first? Sure. Victor Frankl, that's what I've been thinking about, right? So how do we make meaning out of this? And how do we, how do we find ways to help others? Because when we do that, uh, we'll, we'll survive and thrive it. Uh, you know, the, the trauma of this makes us hunker down. Like I said, mama bear, self-protect, hoard toilet paper, rah, get off my lawn. Um, and we're going to get through this if we look up. And if we look up and find people who need help, uh, people who need connection, people who need masks, people who need food. Uh, how can we help? And what are even ways when we're at home that we can be of service to the common good? Thank you, Sally. Summer or John, who wants to go first? 
Uh, Summer, it's all you. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I only, you know, it's such a big question. And I, I feel like I only have a little bit to contribute to such a large question. But I think um, with all of the, I don't want to call it disconnect, but all of the disagreements that I'm seeing, right, between these factions of, of people who have um, very differently situated beliefs about COVID-19, I what I would like to see going forward is, and I, I think it was Gabe, you, you said, you know, sometimes you just, you, when, when people are so ideologically opposed, it's really hard to find middle ground. But I really think that finding middle ground, finding shared meaning, finding ways to move forward and find those little areas of agreement um, are really important in repairing what has been lost socially, right? And that, that seems to be more of my concern right now than um, you know recovering from the, the medical aspects of coronavirus. I mean, obviously like that's incredibly important too, you know, and I'm sure people who work in medical profession can speak to that more, but you know, my main focus is on the social aspect. I don't wanna move forward and go back into the classroom in the fall if we have in-person classes um, and, and have, trouble with class discussions, you know, about this subject because people are just on polar opposite sides still, you know, I want to see more conversation between people. I want to see, um, you know, more questioning of how we know what we know. Um, and I think just repairing a lot of those social connections and increased media literacy as we move forward. Those are just some of the things that, you know, I want to see as a positive outcome of this. Yeah, so, so so valuable, um, some of those things that you just mentioned. Uh, it, it would be so much helpful if citizens were, you know, better educated, more informed, under, understood more clearly what differentiates a legitimate news source from a, a fake news source. Um, I'd like to think, you know, a few years from now, we can look, we'll be able to look back on this time and say, hey, you know, we as Americans, we pulled together and we got through it. Right now, it's not clear to me that that's going to be how history looks at this time. Uh, I'm, I'm still hopeful that, that that is what is going to be the final outcome. But right now, um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm, I guess I'm like most people. I'm, I'm uh, unsure about the, the future. Uh, hopeful, but unsure. And also understanding that the science behind uh, the way out of our current situation is going to take time. And if there's one thing Americans need to do right now and in the, in the near future is to be patient, to be patient with policymakers, to be patient with the scientists and the researchers who are working day in and day out um, trying to figure out this, this particular coronavirus. And No. Did we oh, lose no. John? <laughs> I think we did. Oh no, no, no! He's gonna pop back up any second, and oh, we're just interrupting. We reopen the economy. There he is. Okay. You you broke up a little bit, John. Oh, Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Up. Oh, yeah. It's saying. Uh, well, hey, wherever I ended, that was a good place. <laughs> <laughs> John, thank you so much. You know, one of the things I'm reminded about is my my sister. Uh, my sister was one of these people before she had children, she walked around and critiqued all the parents that she saw, you know, and said things like, you know, my child will never do this and my child will never do that. Well, when I have a kid, they're not going to be this way. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, her, her kid did every single thing that she said that her child would never do like. <laughs> it's humbling. Uh, yeah. And I, I've noticed myself doing this where I'm wandering around saying, oh, well, that's not how I would get through the pandemic. And that's not, and I, I, I have a little bit in that I at least have a pandemic to go through, uh, but you know, it, it's still kind of a jerk move, right? It, it's, it's, it's kind of a jerk move to tell other parents how to raise their kids. And it's a double jerk move when you don't have kids yourself, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still a jerk move when you do have kids. And, and it, you know, that, that's kind of that's kind of the takeaway that I'd like for a lot of people. I, I, I see a lot of people questioning how other people are surviving the quarantine and the pandemic and how they're managing. And, and it, I, I know there's an upper limit. I, I know that we probably should be, you know, ever so judgmental if you're not wearing a mask, for example. But 
I, I think we need to cut everybody a break. And I think we need to cut ourselves a break. I, I think the goal right now is to be around when this is over and to do our best to get through it to the other side. And I think we need to remember that. And while all the Facebook memes about taking the time to learn to paint, play the guitar, learn a second language are, are good notions, uh, I'll be happy if my clothes still fit at the end of it. And, and I think that's okay. And I, I think that we need to be just less judgmental of others and less judgmental of ourselves. So and even that's if you don't, really Gabe, my big message. Okay too. Even if my clothes don't fit. <laughs> if they don't, that's okay. I, I, I was on the phone with my friend Margaret the other day um, talking about this and she was like, I can't believe you finished your dissertation. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm worried that it's not that good. I don't like my chapter five that much, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, summer, summer. We're all just trying to survive now. Like that's, that's the bar is low. Just just you know that's where we're at <laughs> so don't don't put pressure on yourself to to perform well or to do incredible work it's not the time we just we just have to plow through this i would still like to point out that i do incredible work i just feel the need to <laughs> I'm just teasing. Thank you, everybody. Uh, listen, obviously, you can head over to psychcentral.com. They have just tons and tons of articles. Uh, we really, really pride ourselves on our articles and our support groups. Uh, but for those who appreciate the medium that is not reading, uh, we also have uh, three different podcasts that we highly recommend. Uh, you know, I am involved in all of them. So if you hate the sound of my voice, do not go to psychcentral.com slash podcasts. But if you want to not read some information, now is a good time to check them out. Again, at psychcentral.com slash podcasts. And obviously for all of the articles, support groups, you can find it all at psychcentral.com. Thank you very much for the last seven weeks. John, thank you very much for coming up with this idea and for supporting it. It's obviously been very, very cool. And Sally and Summer, thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care.